A service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer that you can add to your application. It allows you to transparently add capabilities like observability, traffic management, and security without adding them to your own code. And this pro picture provides a kind of a visual of what we're talking about. So let's say we have application A that wants to add, talk to application B. A service mesh, ma mesh must provide these capabilities, such as observability, security, traffic management, and resilience. In other words, this should come for free, and applications should, or the developers should, shouldn't have to write these capabilities in order to provide those features for, for us. Let's go through each one of those. Resilient connectivity means service-to-service -service communication must be possible across boundaries, such as cloud, clusters, and premises. Communication must be resilient and fault-tolerant. L7 traffic management. Load balancing, rate limiting, and resilience, resiliency must be L7 aware. That is, HTT, must support HTTP, REST, gRPC, WebSocket, etc. Identity-based security. So application A must be able to uh, verify that it is who it is uh, claiming to be. And that is another feature that services provides. Observability and tracing. Observability in the term of tracing and metrics is critical to understanding, monitoring, and troubleshooting applications, stability, performance, and availability. So before getting into how Cilium provides the service mesh or service mesh features, let's talk about one another service mesh, an establishment called Issue that I've covered. Um, previously, you can watch those videos here. Let's go over the architecture of how this implements these features and how Cilium tries to improve on what these other or older service mesh providers provide. When you install Istio, it will install uh, what is known as Istio Control Plane. Basically, a number of components that consists of Pilot, Citadel, and Galley. So let's go through and see what each one does. The Pilot basically provides service discovery for the Envoy sidecar. We'll talk about sidecars in just a sec. The Citadel basically provides security, uh, authentication, um, and so on. And Galley basically provides integration between uh, Istio and uh, Kubernetes. And then in order to basically use Istio, we need to specify which namespaces will be managed by Istio. And we need to then create a label for that namespace, for instance, for, for our default namespace. And we need to specify Istio dash injection equal to true. And once we do that, then Istio will take over and manage the, the services. So when you install an application, let's say my, my service, then as usual, it just installs the pod on a node. However, note that it also injects an Envoy proxy. So this is basically, it's called a sidecar. So basically it installs a, another uh, container, which is called um, Envoy proxy. That would be a sidecar for this pod. And all communication going in out and coming in into the container that contains the application is intercepted by this Envoy proxy and provide the services. These are mostly L7 um, uh, traffic management, such as load balancing, uh, TLS termination, uh, stage rollout, for instance, how many, what percentage, percentage of the traffic should come to this pod and so on. So these are other um, services that it provides through um, Envoy Proxy. Also, Envoy Proxy <coughs> becomes the agent that enforces the uh, security for uh, Istio. If you install other application, as you can see, it also, each application gets its own um, Envoy Proxy. 
So as you can see, as you add applications, more containers are added to the, the pod. And then that creates really, if, you're, if you have a lot of applications running in production, each one of those containers that are added, it adds overhead to our application overall. And also if you are in a cloud situation, if you add more resources such as containers, then it adds, uh, you have to pay more because they consume, they charge for that, they also consume uh, CPU and so on. So this is one of the issues that uh, Issue or uh, Cilium is tries to resolve. So let's go ahead and take a look at what is Cilium's vision for uh, service mesh. So Cilium's vision and philosophy is all the features that we talked about in terms of service mesh, such as observability, security, and traffic management, they all really belong inside kernel. And as we saw most of these features in other mesh providers such as Istio, they are implemented as sidecar. And those provide uh, or give us a lot of overhead, which really we don't need and we don't want. So <clears throat> eventually, Cilium wants to move all of those inside uh, kernel as EPPF programs. If you are not familiar with EPPF, that is a way of extending the Linux kernel without having to recompile everything. And I talked about eBPF programming in my introduction to Cilium. Um, if you want, you can um, click on link up here to view it. So even without installing service mesh uh, today, some of the features such as observability and some of the security and some of the traffic management are installed already at eBPF. So observability is already completely installed as eBPF, installed kernel. Security, right now only network security is moved into eBPF. And traffic management for level L2, L3, and L4, but L7 is not there. And optionally, you can also install WireGuard if you want to encrypt tra um, transportation between uh, a pod, like say a pod on this node wants to talk to another pod on a different node, then we can enable WireGuard to encrypt the, whole, the entire channel between these two nodes. Uh, note that this requires uh, operating or a kernel version, the next kernel version 5.6 or later. But once, if we install service mesh version one, so that is V1, then it will also install L7 traffic management. So as you can see, it is not implemented as an APPF program for this version. And also this is implemented per node. So rather than injecting the proxy into each pod as a uh, sidecar, um, this will be installed as a service and it manages all the pods. So when the traffic management, uh, L7 traffic management is required, then it kicks in and it kind of direct the traffic. So this is a lot less overhead than having a sidecar inside each pod that we saw in case with uh, Isio. Note that, however, that MTLS, that is mutual authentication, is not included in this version of service mesh. That is the, the earlier, the, the first release of service mesh uh, that I'm working with right now, it does not have MTLS installed. I'll talk about MTLS, what it is a little bit later in this video. But keep in mind that that is not enabled. And also, WireGuard is not enabled for L7 uh, traffic. And L7 traffic management, as we saw with uh, same as um, same as Istio, it provides things such as load balancing, TLS um, termination, rate limiting, and so on. So those are the features that comes with L7 traffic management. We will see those in action, some of those when we do the first demo. So again, the the vision is for the future that even this L7 traffic traffic management also to be moved inside uh, kernel as ABPF 
programs. Next, we're going to do some demo to show you some of the existing or some of the features included with the first version of Cilium Service Mesh. So before setting up the Ingress controller, which provides L7 traffic management for us for testing, we, also, we obviously we need to have a cluster already set up. So if you don't have a cluster set up, I provided um, the scripts here that you can run on your machine in order to set up um, the prerequisites that are required to set up the cluster. So this section, the first section here, um, as I mentioned here, we need to run this on all our, all our nodes. Once the prerequisites are set up, then we are ready to set up the cluster. And on line 62, sudo kube uh, ADM in it. We need to pass in this parameter dash dash skip dash phases is equal to add on slash qproxy. Basically, what it means is bypass installing qproxy because uh, Cilium actually has its own uh, replacement for qproxy and it uses eBPF. Uh, it is essential that you set up your cluster without qproxy. And then once you run that, once the, com uh, the command is completed, once the cluster is set up on the master node, then it gives you a command, cube ADM join, and you need to run that on, on each other node, like say two or three, whatever number of nodes that you have. You have to remote into those and run the cube ADM join command with the parameters that it gives you here. So you make sure you copy a uh, complete command from this section here once it's completed and then remote into your other nodes and run that to set up other nodes as well. And then uh, we need to create a .cube folder in the home directory and we need to copy the config file from um, the, the admin um, config file into this folder here so we otherwise we won't be able to manage the Kubernetes and then we need to set up the appropriate permissions on that. The next step is to install Cilium CLI and this is to download that and um, copy it that to appropriate location. And then finally we um, add Cilium to the um, Helm repository. And then over here on line 88 and 89, this is how we set up the Cilium through Helm. Uh, the version that I, the latest version while recording this was uh, 112.3 version here. And then also make sure you change the IP address. This is the IP address of your master. Then you need to uh, make sure that everything is running. Uh, so you need to wait a few minutes and then check to see all the nodes are ready. So line 97. Make sure that all your nodes are in ready state before proceeding. Also check, make, make sure that all the um, pods in the cube system, nine main space, they're all in run, running state. Uh, running state. If they are in you know wait um, or pending state, either wait. Sometimes you need to you need to actually reboot. Um, the nodes in order to make, make everything work. And finally, uh, we need to make sure that um, the cube proxy replacement is uh, set up correctly, as we mentioned earlier. So we get one of the uh, agents. So in, in line 191, I'm just going to grab one of the agents, Cilium agent, and I'm going to echo it out. So this is one of the agent that we can use. So we need to remote into that on line 105 and run this command. So we cube uh, CTR exec minus 80 minus N cube system because that is in the cube system and the name of the agent that we grabbed in uh, line 102. And we need to run this command Cilium status stash or bar um, grep Q proxy replacement. So if you run this, you have to mention, um, you have to see that the Q replacement is strict. 
If it's not strict, then you won't be able to run any of the class uh, or Cilium mesh feature. So we make sure that this is uh, set to strict. And again, that goes back to this step up here that we set up. We, we made sure that we bypass the proxy over here. And then the rest of the uh, code here, you can set up your uh, set up the hobble, enable hobble, uh, download that and install that. So again, I've done, I've gone through that in the previous episode. So I'm not going through every line. Basically, this is very self-explanatory. Uh, you can run that and set up your hobble. So have hobble again will be used for uh, monitoring um, your your system or uh, your Kubernetes environment and your mesh. And one thing, um, the before setting up the ingress, we need to have a load balancer set up. So if you're in the cloud environment, then it's easy. The, the provider would actually set it up for you. You can request it. If you are testing it in your own like machine uh, um, lab environment and you don't have a load balancer, then you can install Metal Lab. And I provided the link uh, or the script here. Basically, it sets up a software-based load balancer. So when the um, ingress creates uh, ingress, uh, and services, all, all those services exclusively use load balancer. So if there is no load balancer in, in your environment, you can't do anything with it. So you have to set up a load balancer. And again, if in your lab environment, if you don't have uh, a cluster or a, a load balancer set up, you can use this to use Metal Lab to set up your own load balancer. And this is again, software based. In this demo, we are going to enable Cilium Ingress Controller and do some testing. Just realize that Cilium takes advantage of Kubernetes Ingress infrastructure and configures Envoy Proxy to do both Ingress and traffic management. So in order to enable the controller, you can either do it through Helm, and this is the command, or you can do it through Cilium's uh, CLI. It's really up to you. So these two commands uh, or these two options that we need to set. One is set ingress controller dot enable true, which basically as it sound as it shows, it will enable the ingress controller. And the other one is to set the ingress ingress controller load balancer mode. There are two options: either dedicated or shared. And I explained what they are up here. Basically, when you set it to dedicated, every time that you create an instance of an ingress controller, then a new load balancer will be created for that. If you set it to shared, then all the traffic coming in, they share the, the same load balancer. So which one to use really depends on your resources. The shared one uh, uses less resources, but you have to be careful not to create conflicts when you set your routes. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. Oh, one thing uh, before I uh, run this, I want to talk about is when you set the ingress controller to true, enable to true, um, it, it sets both the ingress controller and the traffic management. But if you don't want to use the ingress controller, you're only interested in the L7 in, in proxy, in uh, the proxy's L7 traffic management, then you can set enable um, envoy dot dash config to true. So instead of this, you will set this to true. But for this demo, we're going to enable both proxy and also other features of the envoy proxy. Let's go ahead and <clears throat> run this. You can see it says it was enabled. Uh, now we need to restart the uh, Cilium operator on uh, line 15. And also on line 16, we need to also restart the Cilium agent. <clears throat> Let me clear this. And it will take a, maybe a minute or so, or maybe more, depending on your um, 
you know, resources that you dedicated to your hardware for to your uh, pods, and uh, it may take uh, maybe a minute to let, let's go ahead and run that status. So we do Selenium status, and we'll see that we have some errors and warnings, and these are indi indicative that the pods are not ready. So the Selenium pods are, are being recreated and they are not ready yet. So we need to wait uh, maybe another minute or so and then we um, check again. Let's go ahead and try again, see if it's, everything is ready. And we'll see now that everything is ready. So we are good to go now. Okay, now in, for this demo, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to install a book info um, demo or, or application, which is actually created by Istio. And this is a very simple application. It's got a product page that people can view uh, books. They can then look at the details of the book. They can set uh, write reviews and also set uh, assigned ratings for books. And over here, you can see the reviews has a number of versions. So this is uh, one of the benefits of um, using L7 uh, features of Envoy is then we can um, share load among various versions. For instance, we are just rolling out a new V3 of our application and we want maybe assign 10% of our load to this one and the rest to the previous one, which are more resilient. Um, so this is possible now doing that uh, by using Cilium, uh Mesh and all, which really basically uses the uh, proxy, the Envoy proxy capability. So let's go back to the code here and run on line 21. We are going to install that application. And as you can see, it installs um, the reviews v1, v2, v3, and other services. So let's take a look at line 23 to make sure all the pods <coughs> are ready for this and you see that they're all in running state. So let's go ahead and clear that. Now we need to define an ingress for this. So that is how, um, when the calls come in, the real, uh, how do we manage that? So, and that is done um, through uh, YAML uh, ingress definition, and um, this is the YAML for it. So the kind is ingress. So this is again, uh, Kubernetes ingress. Um, then it has a name uh, and the namespace that it belongs to. And the spec, this is where we kind of, this is where Cilium comes into play. Ingress class name, Cilium. So basically Cilium will be managing that through Envoy. And then we have under rules, we have HTTP and under paths. Um, first look at the path. One is called slash detail. And the other one, basically there is no um, it's just slash. There's no nothing else uh, beyond that. So basically what it means that if the calls come in and has ends with dash details, then we need to, uh, this part needs to be executed. Basically, which means that looks at under the service. So there's a service called details we just deployed. That service will be uh, kind of will be called the call will be forwarded from the client to that service, which is listening on part on port 9080. If we don't specify anything, and this is the default page, um, basically the product page, then that will be executed or will be sent to this service, Kubernetes service called product page. And again, the port number is listening on is port 9080. So let's go ahead and run this. That's what created. And then on line 27, we can verify that kubectl get Cilium Envoy config. So basically it creates a config map uh, in Kubernetes. And this is the name of that. So going from backward, basic ingress was the name that we gave to this um, ingress. And then Default is the name of the namespace that is running, will be running on, and this is Cilium Ingress. So it is managed by Cilium. 
You can also take a look um, at more detail. KubeCTL describe uh, Cilium Envoy. When you run that, it gives you a lot more information. You can dig into it and understand how what, what the settings are. Okay, on line 30, let's go ahead and um, do kubectl get service. Let's go ahead and run that. And we'll see that these are the details and a product page and re uh, reviews. That those are the services that we just installed. We also see that it has created the service a type load balancer. And this is for our um, ingress. So this is this load balancer is dedicated to our application. And the, the, this IP ad, uh, address is 192.168.0.80, so that is the ingress um, IP address, and is listing on port 80. On line 32, we can also do kubectl get ingress, and we get basically the same thing, the name, this is our name of our um, basic ingress, and the address is, again, 192.168.0.80. Dot AD and listening on port 80. Okay, let's go um, scroll down. Now, before uh, doing uh, calling this service and do some testing on line 34, you can install um, JQ basically because the results that come back when we call the service is in um, JSON format. So it's easier to read. You can install um, JQ, and that is the command that you need to do. I'm already, I've already installed that. I'm not going to run that. And then on line 80, we want to get the IP address of the load balancer that we just created. And that would be basically this 1.1.90.160.080. I just want to, want to put it in a variable to or easier to um, manage with. And then we echo it out. So we get the same thing, 192.168.0. Okay, now we're going to call the service. So curl dash dash fail dash s HTTP. And then this is the IP address of our load balancer, and details and one. So let's go ahead and then we pump it, um, pipe it into JSON. Let me run that. So this is the result that we get. So the ID is one, the author name, the year and so on. So these are the information that we get from our service. You can also um, call the service without specifying any anything. And um, as we saw here, if we don't specify anything, it just calls the product page. So let's go ahead and do that. Call that. And you can see this is the HTML. This is the um, default page that the application uh, displays when Somebody called from outside. Um, a user wants to look at books. This is the first the, the first page that they're going to call into. In the previous example, we used um, HTTP REST service for our example testing um, Cilium Ingress, but that is not the only protocol. Of course, we can also use gRPC. If you have a service that is written in gRPC, you can take advantage of the ingress as well. So for this application, we are going to use a different um, sample. And this one is written in uh, gRPC. The service is in gRPC, as mentioned. It's a Google application. Basically, this is called a hipster shop. So it's a, a fictitious shopping um, application. It's got a front end and they got a number of services such as shipping, currency, checkout, uh, and so on. So let's go back to the application and we're going to download that. And now the services are installed. We also need now to create an ingress for this application. And this is the um, YAML for that. This is very similar to the other application. Again, the kind is ingress. You select a name, we call it grpc-ingress. And again, this is a Cilium managed um, ingress. And again, we have the, um, the rules and paths and so on. So in this case, we have two paths. One is this, 
So if the call if the call is made with this in this format, which ends into slash hipster shop dot product uh, product catalog service, then this service which is listening on this port number will be responding. And similarly, if the call format is this, then this service listening on this port number will respond. Anything else will throw an exception. Let's go ahead and run that and install that in, uh, ingress as well. On, let's check on line 60 kubectl get ingress. And now we see we have two. That is from the previous example. And now this is we have gRPC. And this one is listening on port 82. Now, in order to test the application, we need to install a utility called uh, grp uh, curl. And so uh, rather than we can't use the regular curl, we need to download this uh, utility. So I've already downloaded that. I'm not going through the process again, but you, when you go through the process to the application, install this. Additionally, because gRPC is a binary encoded for a form um, protocol, we also need a file called Porto. So a Porto file is a description of the gRPC API written in the protocol buffer language uh, specification. The reason for this is because the client needs to communicate with the server and it needs this file. Uh, we can think of it as a dictionary so that the client can talk to the um, to server. So a little bit more complicated than um, the rest, but it's not that it's not really that complicated. A little bit more work needs to be done. So we need to create the they already created a protocol file, so we need to download that. And then online. As 74, we are going to get the IP address, which um, was this one, 192.168.0.82. So I'm just put, going to capture that and put that into a variable. And we can now call um, a couple of services on line 77. We're going to call this grp curl dash plain text. And then the Porto is the one that we just downloaded. And this is basically the rest of it. This is the service. And then you can see that this ends in um, get support, uh, support the currency. So let's go ahead and run that. You see that now the result is coming back. And these are all the currency that are used. We can also, on line 79, we can call a different service and this one is list products. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see this is now the list of products that this uh, site sells. So to better understand how the ingress works, let's visualize what we did in the previous example. So we deployed two applications, one called book info. So these two services are were part of that application. And because we have two nodes, those services are replicated across both our nodes. We also deployed an application called Hipster Shop, and these are the services that are part of that. We also deployed the, the, the pods that actually power those services. There are four pods. Each one of those represent the, uh, each one of those services. Two are on one node and two on uh, or the other node. And as you can see, because we are using Cilium, Cilium does not use um, QProxy, uh, and also it doesn't use uh, IP tables for load balance. So it uses eBPF, um, an APF service for managing the load balancing. And that represents the load balance of each one of those. In this application, we only have one pod for each application. So there's only one, uh, application or one pod associated, IP address associated with each service, but you could have multiple of those. And then the load balancer will take um, care of the internal load balancer, would take, take care of managing or um, distributing the load among the services that are, or pods that are associated with that. And each IP address is represented here by each pod. 
this one over here, that for that, and so on. So, and then we define um, an ingress because we want to allow our external users to be able to leverage and consume our application. We define uh, an ingress, and then we define the, uh, for each one of those, which each one of those services we define an ingress, uh, have their, having their own ingress. So this represents the book info service, as we saw. And then these are basically um, the, the, the way that we define the ingress. We need to specify the path. So anything that comes in with the slash dot details, then it will call a service called details, which is this one here. And if um, it, we don't specify anything, um, then it will hit a service called product page, which is this. And any other um, combination will be thrown an exception. So these are the only uh, two valid paths that we can specify. So when we apply that, then Cilium and Kubernetes will define, create a load balancer for our application. And then we have end users can then consume that. So let's say this user wants to consume the service, the details, like which is this service here. So it issues the HTTP and then the IP address of the load balancer. The load balancer is listening on port 80. Then the request comes in. It's a load balancer and load balancer picks one of those. Um, uh, as round, round robbing, so, and then let's say pick this one. Then the request goes in inside our, this node here. Then it's intercepted by the ingress. And then the ingress takes a look at the URL and the path. And then it um, decides that because it ends with details, then it will send the request to detail service. This is the IP address, uh, internal IP address, and, uh, uh, and, and the port number, which will specify here. And the load balancer then sends the request to only one um, pod that is associated with it, with it. So it sends it to the pod. Then the pods execute that, generates the results. So this is information about uh, details of a, a book. And then that is sent back to the user. So this information, um, it's not secure because we're using HTTP. And oftentimes, especially if the client is outside the cluster, we need to use TLS. And that is what we'll discuss next. How do, how do we define a TLS termination for our service? So what we really like to do is to create a single ingress object that is responsible for managing traffic to both applications, that is book info and hipster shop. Um, but we want to introduce, introduce TLS termination. That is, we want to encrypt the communication between the clients that they're, they're coming from outside the client, uh, outside the cluster and the services that are hosted inside the cluster. So we can easily do that again by creating a new ingress. Um, I'll highlight that the, uh, the differences in just a different color. So because, because we are now hosting um, or using this ingress to host two applications, we need to specify two different hosts because one uh, traffic, some traffic is coming, will be coming from for hipster, um, hipster So that would be the host name. And the other one is coming from the book info. So the host name is bookinfo.cilium.rocks. Within those sections though, nothing really changes because we still have the slash details. That is if they're um, calling the service for everything else, the slash path, it will go to this service. And similarly for hipster shop, um, hipster shop .rocks, again, we have two paths, one is this one and the other one is this one. And those are the port numbers for each one of those, as we saw earlier. Um, we also need to, because this is uh, TLS, we need to specify a TLS section here, the hosts. 
that uh, matches this. And those will be, and then we also need to create a secret and which is based on the keys of um, the TLS certificate that we will generate. We'll go through that in the demo. But once we apply that, again, it will create a load balancer for our now two applications and will generate, will assign an IP address. But this time it will be listening on 443, not on port 80. So when the client calls a service, they need to specify HTTPS because now this is TLS. And then the service name or the application service that they want to call, this one, bookinfo.cilium.rock slash detail.1. Again, I'm calling this service. Then the request goes through. Um, the, again, the same way that we talked earlier, but the, again, the only difference here is now the communication is um, secure, is encrypted. So the request comes in again, and then the, the ingress will intercept that, looks at the URL. First, the host name is booksinfo.cilium.rock, so that then this section will be executed and then looks at the path which is details. So it will be again sent to the detail service, which is listening on port 9080. And then we go through the same process. Nothing really changed internally as far as um, Kubernetes in, is involved. And then the results are generated and it's sent to the user. Now let's go ahead and implement the TLS terminated ingress that we just described. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to get the TLS certificate because encryptions uh, in TLS, uh, they use certificates. So we need to have a valid certificate. In the corporate environment, you will be using um, a CA signed certificate, which is trusted both on the Kubernetes server and on the client. However, in our lab environment, we don't have that. So we need to <coughs> generate our own certificate, CA certificate, um, for testing purposes. And so there's a utility called Mini CA that we will be using uh, for this demo. Um, well, first we need to install Go because we need to uh, actually compile that um, utility. So on line 95, uh, sudo apt install Golang. So you need to install that, make sure you install that. And then we need to download the, the source for that utility. So that is the address. I've already downloaded that. And then we, when we download that, it creates a subfolder called mini CA. And then on line 100, we, we need to build that. And then once we do that, then we have that utility generated. And then on line 101, we assign, basically assign reads, um, read permission so anybody can run that utility. Finally, on line 105, we are now ready to actually generate our certificate using mini CA. And that is a command, um, mini CA dash domains. So we need to specify the domains that are valid for this. And our services are end, both end at dot cilium dot rock. So star dot cilium dot rock. So any um, calls a uh, request that has this part of, as part of the URL, then it will be uh, accepted for encryption. So once we run that, then it generates, let's go ahead and run that. We generate two files. One is called mini CA uh, PEM. This is the public address, pub public key of the certificate. And the other one is mini ca dot key dot dash key dot pen. So this is the private key um, that will be used for encryption. I'll talk about encryption and TLS and MTLS a little bit later in this demo. For for now, this is what it generates. So that's what uh, those are the pieces that are needed for encrypting our communication. Then on line one ten. KubeCTL create secret. So we need to create a secret based on the keys that we generated. 
and we call it demo cert. And these are the keys. So the public key and the private key that we were generating in the previous examples. If you recall, this is the definition of our um, ingress that we talked about in the, in the TLS section. It has a section called secret name and demo secret. This is what, what we want to generate. So we generate uh, the secret called demo cert. So let's go ahead and generate that. And we see that that was generated. Now we are ready now to deploy uh, our ingress that we define, we define it here in this YAML. Let's go ahead and execute that and we'll have the ingress generated. Now let's validate that on one line 116, kubectl one, one, get ingress. And see that uh, we now have a new ingress called TLS ingress. And these are the two hosts that associate. And then this is the IP address. And then it listens on port 443 as we discussed earlier. Now, what we need to do is we need to add the host name that we specified in the, in the YAML for our service definition. Uh, one was book info.cilium.rocks. And the other one was hipstershop.cilium.rocks. Because we need to have that, those should be part of the URL. We can't use IP addresses. So we need to use a DNS that has that. So we, on our lab environment, we can add them into our host. So let's go ahead and add them. I've already defined those. So book info.cilium.rocks, so that is the IP address of the load balancer. And the same thing for hipster shop.cilium.rock. And again, that the IP address, which is the IP address of the load balancer. Let's go ahead and execute that. Let me clear that. And finally, we are ready now on line 121 to actually call the service. So curl, and we need to specify the certificate, because again, the certificate is self-signed, is not trusted, so we need to specify that. If we don't want to do that, we don't want to specify the certificate uh, as part of this, you need to um, use dash dot k. So that will uh, basically uh, does not validate the certificate at all. So now that we generate the certificates, we're going to use that certificate for calling the service. So let's go ahead and run that, and we'll see that it get, they usually gives us some information about the TLS handshake, but at the bottom here, this is what we are after, and this is the information that we were looking for. So that's, we see that, that it worked. We can do the same thing for the other service. And remember the other service was uh, gRPCs. So a little bit different, um, but basically we, we do the same thing. So what we need to download the portal information as we did before. And then on line 126, GP, um, GRPC URL, then they specify the proto and then the uh, address of that. Well, we need to specify the only difference with the previous example that we did with um, port uh, or no encryption, but we need to specify port 443 because now this is encrypted. So if we go ahead and run that, We'll see that now we get the book info as we did before. In this section, we are going to discuss L7 or layer seven traffic management features in Cilium Service Mesh. First recall that when we enable Service Mesh on Cilium, it deploys an Envoy image on each node to support HTTP policy enforcement and observability. Also note that any configuration related to the uh, Envoy proxy that are saved as CRDs in the etcd. Also note that Envoy extensions are resource types that may or may not be built into an Envoy build. This build of Envoy has been optimized for the needs of Cilium agent that does not contain many of the Envoy extensions 
available in the Envoy code base. So if you go to the Envoy um, web page, you will see a lot of features that are not, or extensions that are not currently built into um, this version of Envoy um, proxy that Cilium uses. So these are the list of supported extensions that are currently available within the Envoy proxy that comes with Cilium. Cilium also provides an SDK so we can write your, our own proxy if these are not, uh, they don't meet our uh, needs, and, but you have to use Go. To showcase the L7 traffic management features of Envoy that powers Cilium's service mesh, we're going to deploy an application. And this is our setup. We have a Kubernetes cluster that consists of a single master and two node, node one and node two. We will then deploy an application called My Service V1. So this will be our, the, the first version of our service, which is contained in the YAML file. And that YAML contains the logic to deploy the application, the pod, and also create the service. So in this case, you'll have a single pod that manage that service. And then recall that we are using ABFF, we are using Cilium's ABFF, a version of um, load balancer. We are not using QProxy or IP tables. And so this is a lot faster and more efficient than IP tables. In this case, we have only one pod, so the load balancer is only pointing to one uh, endpoint. So keep in mind that this is L4 load balancing, L7 traffic management um, will be done by Envoy as we, will, as we will see. We will then deploy the next version of our my service. Maybe we added some new features. Um, and also uh, that YAML also creates a service for my second ver uh, V2 service of our application. Now we have V1 and V2. So we want to intelligently now load balance the traffic. And the logic is this, 80% um, of the traffic should be um, forwarded to V1 of our service and 20% to V2. <clears throat> so V2 is a kind of a, a canary deployment. We wanna make sure that everything works before we convert everything to V2. We also want to set other settings such as the load balancing policy we want to use uh, round robin. We have other options, or so for this one, we're going to use uh, round robin. We want to set the connection timeout to five seconds and also retry policy. So this applies to type 500. So these are the server types error. We want to try three times before we take a node out uh, of the load balancer. And we want to wait one second per, per try. We also want to introduce L7 um, path translation. And this is very useful, for instance, if we rename an interface on the service, but we don't want to our client to immediately change. We don't want to change our clients immediately. We can um, then translate that. For instance, let's say um, we want to, um, if the path, they, they specify info, which maybe is an old, um, um, interface name, we want to then translate it to slash computer. So without changing the, the client, we can do that on the fly uh, or uh, the proxy can do that for us. We want to also um, uh, manage the outlier. So outlier detection means that um, the proxy keeps track of all the endpoints and detects if there, if there are any changes between them. For instance, if one of them is significant, significantly slower or throw exceptions or times out, then it can take that offline. And we, it provides us for, for some setting or some knobs that we can manage. One, the first one we wanna take advantage of is split external and local errors. So uh, external errors means the, the type like 500 that comes from the server. We want to um, distinguish them from the local error. So when we uh, onboard, um, reports, uh, we want to have two separate buckets, one for external errors and one for uh, local errors. Also, we want to um, 
after two local um, origin failures. So local means that um, timeout, for instance, uh, the timeout that we, we, we were trying to uh, connect to the server, but it times out locally. It's not maybe on the server side, but this on the local. It times out, it can connect. Um, so that those are the local type error. So if two of those errors uh, happen in consequence, like in a row, then we want uh, the load balancer to take that uh, node offline. And then we have a YAML file that contains these policies. Again, we're going, we'll go, we'll go into the YAML file in more detail during the demo, but this is kind of the, uh, the summary of what this YAML file will contain. Once that's applied, it will write that into the, uh, CR, into the CRD, into the HCD, and then all the uh, um, envoys will, ta will take those settings, will uh, we'll send those settings to um, all the envoys on, on the nodes. So when the traffic comes in, that is destined either to this IP, um, cluster IP, this IP address, or this IP address on um, any node, either on this node or that node, it really doesn't matter. Then, and this could be coming directly from on the server, if you're in the cluster environment, um, you could use the cluster IP or the virtual um, DNS name for that service, or if, you, if the traffic might be coming from outside through node port or the load, external load balancer, it really doesn't matter. As, as soon as it hits the cluster IP, then um, Envoy intercepts that and then consults the, um, the logic for that, and then it keeps track of the traffic, how much how much of the traffic has gone to V1, for instance, and how much has gone V2, and according to that, it will send the traffic then to either of those uh, two versions. So we are back in Visual Studio Code to take a look at um, the YAMLs that YAML files that we implement on the service, the example that we just talked about. So let's take a look at uh, my service. Um, v1 of the my service. Uh, it, this is very simple. Um, YAML. It's got two sections. Uh, the the first part is for deployment. So the first one is kind is deployment, and then uh, this is where I get my simple um, hello world type application from, and then I call the application uh, my service v1, and the container listens on port 8080. And then the YAML had the other section, which is the, the service. So we also implement the service in the same YAML. Again, they, I call it uh, my service uh, v1. And the type is load balancer. In this case, it doesn't have to be. It can, could be a node port or cluster IP. And then selector, we are selecting my, my service v1. So this is the pod name that we talked about up here. <coughs> The service also, this is on port 8080 and then forwarded to port 8080, which the container is listening on. Same thing here. We have my service v2. And again, the only difference is it's got a different version. Um, and again, descending on port 8080 and the rest is the same. So we have the service, the second service called my service v2. And again, descending on port 80. AD. So now let's take a look at the Envoy configuration, the YAML file here. Um, so the kind is Cilium cluster-wide Envoy config. So as the name suggests, this is a cluster-wide definition of Envoy configuration. And there's also one without the, the cluster-wide and just Cilium Envoy config. And that is uh, that needs to be and tied to a specific namespace. For, for this one, we are using the cluster Y, which is available in all uh, namespaces. So we select a name like any other object in Kubernetes. Um, and that is what I call it. And the specs, so these are the actual services in Kubernetes that will be powering um, this configuration or this configuration we're listening on. Uh, first one is 
my service v1 which is in the default namespace and this the other one is the second version of our application which is my service v2 and again this is a namespace under the default then we need to specify the resources that will be used for this configuration and the first one is the listener so this is actually um, what, what uh, implements the listener for for this uh, envoy configuration again we need to select a name for it and then we need to specify the filters that will be applied to this so <clears throat> for this we need to we need to have a connection manager that manages the connection and that is defined here we need to define a type for it and that type um, points to what extensions that ha has that and that extension is called v3 so it's the full name um, HTTP connection manager recall that Homeboy has a lot of extension but not all of them are supported within this release of Cilium. However, the connection, the HTTP connection manager is one of the basic ones which is supported. And then we define um, a start prefix. So what it means is that Envoy is always listening or taking, keeping track of all the connections that succeeded, the one that failed, the one that timed out. And then we, we, we tell it which one to actually start collect statistics for and this is the name of our listener we created up here we also need to define uh, rds which stands for raw discovery system for that we need to specify a raw config name uh, and this one is called uh, lb under route one and this is basically lb, LB under route and that is um, defined over here we'll go over that in a second and then we also need to specify the filters that apply to this. In this case, the only filter that we'll be using is the router. The router. So, and this is this is the router section configuration section that we kind of alluded to that. Again, it has a name, um, lb underscore route, and that is the one we specify up here. And it has. Um, and virtual host. So virtual host is the top level section of the route configuration. And um, you can have more one or more um, virtual hosts. And each one has a name and also the, the domain. So a virtual host can support multiple domains. In this case, we really don't care about domains. The star, which means that we accept um, all the domains, um, so we are not really picky about what domains are um, is being called. And then we need to define the routes, actual routes, and the match would be the first one is computer. So this my service has two uh, interfaces. One is slash computers, and the other one is slash health. So for the slash computer, this section will be. Uh, the configuration will be um, executed. First, weighted clusters. So we need to define clusters. The clusters basically is the configuration for the load balancer part of Envoy. And they are defined below here at, at, the, at the bottom. One and these two each for each one of those listeners. So let's go up here. And so that is a, the, the first one is um, called default slash my service v1. And this is where we define the, the weight. 80% we want to go to on my service v1. And for my service v2, we want 20% of the traffic goes to that. And then under retry policy, as we discussed, we will be retrying on error type 500 and the number of retries is three and we wait one second for each one of those tries. So basically if there are more than um, three times um, or we tried we, tr we uh, try uh, try three times that um, service and it failed then 
then that will be taken offline. And then, and for health, very much, very similar to that. Again, the way the cluster, we have cluster one and cluster two. For 80% will go to cluster one, which is this one. And 20% basically goes to this, the other service. An exact same policy. And we listen on again, error 500, and then we try three times. And the last section is slash info. So this is the one that we rewrite. So the whole purpose of this is if let's say we rename an interface in the service, but we don't want the client to change the clients. So what we could do is we do a rewrite and this is a rewrite logic here. And we are looking for slash info. If that in includes sli start with uh, slash info and end with anything, then we will be substitute that to slash computer. So that goes to the first interface. And again, um, the weight is the same as the other one, 80%, 20% for service one and service V1 and V2 respectively. And the last part is the cluster that we talked about. So that basically um, contains the configuration for the load balancer. So the first one is a default slash my service V1. And then here we define the connection timeout as we discussed in the slide before, five seconds. And the policy is around robbing. And the type is EDS. And therefore the outlier detection as we discussed, we are going to split the, um, or we distinguish between the external and internal errors. And then we also then, if there are more than two consecutive um, errors that original locally, for instance, um, connection uh, timeout, then this will be taken offline and all the calls will be coming to this section. And this section, um, again, very uh, similar uh, three second um, connection timeout, round robin and exactly like the other one. So now let's go ahead and actually apply those YAMLs online. Five, you're going to apply the first one, which is my service V1. And the YAML is coming actually directly from um, the GitHub. And I'll provide the link to all the source code and the description. You can get, go ahead and um, get them from my um, repository. So let's go ahead and run that in line five. And as you can see, it created both the deployment and the service. And then on line six, we're going to capture the cluster IP that associated with this service. Let's go ahead and run that. And we're also going to capture the uh, port number, <coughs> which is 8080 in this case. We're going to also capture that and put it in a variable for convenience sake. And then on line eight, we can now exercise the service. We can call the service, curl HTTP, then the cluster IP that we captured up here and the port number. So let's go ahead and run that. And this is what we get from <coughs> the service. It returns the host, the host name, and the operating system type, which is Linux. It also <coughs> returns the IP address of the service. On line 10, we can also, uh, because we created uh, the service as a load balancer, we can also capture lo the load balancer IP address. Let's go ahead and do that. And then on line 11, we can also then call the service. And this time we're going to use the load balancer IP and the port number that we have before, we got before. And we get the exact, exact same message because the node port and the, um, Load balancer, they both actually, when we call a service through node port or the load balancer, the call action is actually forward the cluster IP. And that's why we get the same results. Okay, let's say uh, we, um, we use our application uh, and then we made some enhancements. So now we are ready to deploy our 
v2 app or app, v2 uh, version of our application let's go ahead and run that on line 15 so this is the v2 version of our service and again it creates the the service and the deployment and the service for our v2 of our application and again like before we're going to capture the uh, service port on the port number and also the um this time we're going to get the load balancer ip address like before we did for v1 and now on line 19 you're going to call that service so we, have, we haven't applied any rules here so um again we, we get the same message but we get the different ip address so if i call this guy here we see that this is 160 if i call this one this guy ends in 144. so we haven't really applied any load balancing logic and that we can we'll do that in uh, on line 22 and so this is the uh, load balancer section yaml that we uh, talk about up here let's go ahead and apply that and we'll see that it says it was created now a tip um, when you create a load balancer it always is successful so if there is any actually error in in the logic it doesn't show you so in order to make sure that it's actually everything is good or if you run into issues if you um, set up the envoy configure or run the configuration and then it's not if it either you know throwing exceptions or it's not doing what it's supposed to do then you can check the errors here so you can check the go to the cilium um, directly and look for the errors um, on the Cilium um, pod and make sure that everything is around. So this is a tip to make sure, keep in mind that if you run into issues, you can also check that. Okay, now that we apply that, uh, recall that 80% will go to V1 and 20% will go to V2. Let's go ahead and run that a few times. So we get 168, now we get 144, 168, 168. You see, majority of it, it goes to um, 10.0.2.168 um, because, uh, because that's our V1 uh, service and that most of the calls go in there. And it doesn't really matter. If we call the, the, the V2, we get the same result. The 144, 168, 168, 168, 168. Again, it really doesn't matter because these two calls as you recall they are intercepted and they and then it kind of waited to see which one um should be forwarded to because again one way keeps track of how many times v1 um has been called and how many times v2 of the service has been called and the last one we are going to now call an interface that actually doesn't exist in the service and that is slash info but it doesn't throw an exception because we have a logic for that and then it uh, the, the envoy we rewrite um, the slash info into slash computer and that's how we get the successful results here in the final section of this video we are going to talk a little bit about security particularly mtls which stands for mutual tls i'll go over what mtls is then we'll discuss how MTLS is implemented in other service mesh providers, such as Isio that use Sidecar. And then finally, we'll discuss how um, Cilium is envisioning, in, envisioning how to use MTLS in their environment uh, to make it more performant. So MTLS is based on certificates. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to ensure that the, the certificate that are used on the on the client and server they are uh, trusted so they need to use a ca authority that is trusted by both client and server and each machine has a list of trusted ca in the public domain um if you use um, certificates such uh, from companies such as verisign then uh, usually all uh, machines support uh, support that in a corporate environment, corporations can set up their own CA authorities. And again, 
um, make that uh, make their clients and servers um, trust that authority. Anyway, after getting uh, getting certificates needed for for this, then the first thing that client does is initiates what is known as a TLS handshake. And it literally is called client hello. So as part of this, it sends some information such as the version of TLS libraries that support, for instance, TLS version 1.0 and so on. Also a list of libraries, encryption li libraries and ciphers that it supports. It also generates a random key and sends that. That is called client random key. And so the server now has that. Similarly, the server generates its own random key and sends the same information as the client. Uh, what kind of uh, encryption you know, library it supports, uh, what version of TLS it supports, and so on. And now client and server, they both have this information. And these um, keys are used uh, at the end to generate um, keys to encrypt and decrypt messages between the two. Then the server sends its uh, certificate for verification to the client. And a certificate has information such as server, server's public key, serial number, val validity period, series um, or server's domain name, issuer's domain name, issuer's digital signature, and so on. So the client, the first thing that it checks, it verifies that the certificate is still valid. Then it checks the issuer's domain name to make sure that it's coming from a valid CA. And then it uses the issuer's public key to ensure that the, the digital certificate, certificate is signature is valid and uh, has not been tampered with. And then the client sends its own client certificate to the server and the same thing, goes through the same process. And then the server validates that the certificate is valid and hasn't been tampered with and is trusted. Next step is for the client, it generates what is known as a pre-master key. And then it uses the server's public key to encrypt that. And then it sends it across to the server. Server, it uses its private key to decrypt that. And now we have client and server have the same number of keys and the same values. And both independently use one of the agreed upon encryption libraries to generate four keys on each side. The server encryption key, it uses to encrypt and decrypt messages on the server. The client encryption key, so the client will be using that to encrypt and decrypt messages. Client MAC or message authority key, it uses to verify that the, the, the message or the signature has not been tampered with on the, uh, the message that is coming from uh, uh, sent from the client and server key has the same thing has Mac uh, Mac key to ensure that the signature has not been tampered with. Let's say now at this point uh, the client wants to send a, a request to the server. Let's say they want to send this request HTTP and then the IP address and port 8080. The message will be encrypted using the client encryption key and then it uses a client MAC key to uh, sign it. That is sent across the wire to the server and server uses the client encryption key and also uh, verifies the signature using the client MAC key. And then forwards a request, let's say to um, an application called Hello World and then the message the, the, or the response is generated. And then it uses the server encryption key to encrypt that and uses the server MAC key 
to sign it and sends it back to the client and client does a reverse and uses the server encryption key to decrypt that and ensure that the uh, signature has not been tampered with and get the message. So this is kind of the overview of how MTLS works. Let's quickly review how Isio implements is MTLS architecture using Sidecar. If you recall, when we installed Isio, it installs its own control plane. And one of the con components within the control plane is called Citadel, which really uh, concerns itself with everything security. And one of the things that it does is provide a CA authority. So all the certificates that it generates will be trusted by all Sidecar. So when we create a new pod and a new sidecar injected, then Citadel also create a certificate for each uh, new pod. And then when one um, pod wants to talk to another pod, for instance, uh, this a client and this is a service, the request starts off as HTTP. However, this request is then intercepted by the sidecar because it needs not to set up an MTLS session. So it does its own TLS handshake with the other sidecar, and because they both use the CA authority, so there's no problem here. Then go through the process that we talk about the TLS, MTLS in the previous slide, and that's how the TLS um, handshake occurs. Then the message, the, uh, the sidecar also provides, obviously, the uh, HTTPS, um, origination and termination because the message needs to be encrypted. So the message it sends um, to, to the other side and then on the other side the sidecar then decrypt the message and the, the message then makes its way to the service and the service then creates its response and then everything is reversed. The handshake will occur again, you know, backwards until uh, this service that originated or this part that originated the call will receive its response from the service. So let's discuss briefly Cilium's vision for its MTLS and message encryption architecture for its mesh. And I say um, vision because at the time of recording of this video, this had not been implemented yet. So they were just, these are the things that they were thinking at the time. So the first thing that they wanted to do was to liberalize the selection of the identity and security management system. You leave it, they kind of leave it up to the users or consumers. So you would be able to you um, bring in a SPIFI or cert manager or issue and set that whatever system that you like at the CA authority. So that would then issue certificates. And the other thing is there will be no agent um, or sidecar. There will be only agent that will manage that on behalf of all the pods. So rather than each pod inject again um, a, a container to move a sidecar to manage the MTLS um, handshake and encryption, and the Cilium agent will be then performing the MTLS uh, handshake on behalf of um, the client or the services. So all the services that are posited are on this side, their CA, uh, the certificate will be managed by the Cilium agent the, and the handshake also will be managed by this agent here. And similarly, on this side, this agent will be managing all the security affairs of the pods on this side. And any in this architecture, you can send any messages in any format, such as TCP, HTTP, UDP, um, I, ICMP. And then the decision to um, encrypt the message or not, they, it, they leave it up to you. So if you are in an environment that you just want to make sure that the service is who it is, then um, that, will, uh, manage, that, that will be achieved through just a TSL uh, handshake. If you don't need encryption, then you can, the messages can be sent directly as they are without any change. 
if you do need to encrypt and and you need uh, privacy uh, in a situation like in the cloud environment, then rather than encrypting each message at this level, a VPN <coughs> um, or virtual private network through wire wireguard will be established between the nodes, and the messages will then uh, will be encrypted and passed through this without making any <coughs> changes to the original message. So the the pipe itself will be secure. And so the messages will then arrive on the other side without any um, TSL origination or terminations. Or, uh, in the previous slide, you saw that in the sidecar situation, the HTTP messages will, uh, would be converted to HTTPS on this side. So that would be the, the T uh, TSL origination. And on the other side, the uh, the messages will be converted back to HTTP. That will be the, the TSL termination, and then will, will be converted to HTTP. So we don't need any of that in this architecture. So these are some of the benefits uh, that we might be getting from this architecture. Um, the first one is connection don't need to be terminated anymore. Like we mentioned here, there is no uh, HTTP, HTTP to HTTPS um, change um, over here. And, and there is no reverse HTTPS to HTTP on this side. No sidecar needed to be injected. So again, that's a huge benefit, performance, and also uh, financially, if you have to pay for each um, additional, for each container that you deploy, you need to have to another sidecar, another container, and those cost money, obviously. And, and the performance also will be huge. And benefits will be huge, so you don't need sidecar. So the, the agents on each node will be taking care of the security uh, stuff. And support non-TCP and multicast, like we mentioned, and it also supports other protocols such as UDP and ICMP and so on. Support for existing identity and certificate management, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, so you can bring your own um, basically, a management system, security management system, as you feel uh, you um, feel necessary. An optional integrity and confidentiality. So again, this pipe is we can use it um, if you need to. We don't need encryption. Then, and a TS, TSL handshake is uh, very it, it's sufficient. Then you don't you don't need to go to set up this environment because the uh, you know, obviously, there will be overhead sitting at the VPN. Um, ob obviously, it's not as bad as having sidecars to manage that, but still, there will be some overhead. So if you don't need that, you only need um, TSL hashing that you can just do without encryption. So note that WireGuard is available today at the time of recording this. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with the uh, Cilium's uh, Mesh. So if you um, if you want to use WireGuard, you can use that at uh, layer uh, three or four, but you can't use it with L7. So you need to disable um, the, uh, the the all the features of uh, the the mesh. And I found this issue and I reported that. And at the time of recording, and there was they were wanted to either improve the uh, the documentation or throw an exception. So if you Enable WireGuard while you're using the, the mesh feature. It doesn't give you any errors, but nothing really works. So just be aware of that. If you want to use WireGuard, you, then you need to disable the mesh features, which is really unfortunate. So I'm going to say this is probably, this is work in progress. And in the future, that uh, issue will not be there. But just be, be aware of that. Overall, I'm very pleased with the direction of Cilium's service mesh direction. First of all, its decision to move the service uh, mesh functionality into the kernel is a great idea. It will improve performance and security. Also, removing the need for sidecar is a huge benefit as far as performance, scalability, and management is involved. Also, separating authentication handshake and payload encryption is also a great idea. 
because sometimes uh, the application in, in some situation, you may not need the authentication part, but you still want to be able to authenticate the service uh, Id identity. And also, if you want to use encryption, then WireGuard it um, operates as a very low level, so it's a lot more performant than Sidecard. There's one thing that is missing, and I hope and that they will add that in the future version of the service mesh is the ability to authorize um, based on a JW um, T token. So this is mostly uh, for authenticating user people. Um, so to see, for instance, a, a user calling an application, a UI, um, and to ensure that the user or the group that the user belongs to is authorized to access that application. So let me show you how ECU has implemented that, and I'm sure this can easily be um, adopted and you know, with some little change in the Cilium um, environment. So at the heart of this scheme is the JWT um, authorization service. And this service um, must be uh, uh, trusted both by the client and the um, servers, which are in the Kubernetes environment. And there's a setting in SU, which we can say add a list of JWT authorization service that it will trust. And then um, when the client when the client wants to call, for instance, the UI application, and that UI may be calling on service in the back end, the first thing that the client will do is it will send his or her user ID and password to the uh, JWT authorization service. And there are various services within that. There's authent authentication, and then a service that generates uh, JWT tokens, and there's another one that validates JWT token. So in this case, the request then, once he or she is authenticated, goes to the other service, and that service actually creates the JWT token. And then that token is sent to the client, and then client uses that token and will uh, co construct the request to the application in the Kubernetes environment. And as part of the header, it will add, um, as part of the authorization bearer, it will add a token that he or she got from the server, and then the rest of it will be the, the service, for HTTP, some service. And the request then goes through the ingress server and allow, arrives um, at the Kubernetes environment in the pod, and then uh, it is intercepted by the Envoy proxy, this is the sidecar, and then it is then sent that token, sends for authori authorization or uh, validation to the JWT server, and this time the validation server um, JWT token validates that, then sends the result okay or not okay back to the application, to the Envoy here, proxy, and based on the decision if the user uh, the token is valid or not, and also if the user is, is the user, uh, first of all, if, if this is valid, and then secondly, if the, the caller is allowed to access the UI application. If um, the, uh, the result is negative, either the token fails or if the token passes, but the user is not authorized um, this application, then the request will fail. Otherwise, if the token is valid, and also, uh, remember, these tokens are short term, very short term. So if it's still valid, and then uh, also the user is authorized to call this UI application, then the request goes but, you know, sent to the, or the UI then calls the services, the back end, and the result is sent back to the client. So this is a very quick overview of how this scheme works. So obviously in the uh, Cilium environment, uh, rather than the Envoy proxy, um, the Cilium agent will probably will be managing this. So actually there's a way that this can be done through 
Envoy proxy, but in my opinion, this should be part of the, should be qualified and standardized as part of the mesh itself. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.